Hello everyone. I'm Tracy Clark. I am a certified ASL interpreter who works in the court system. I have my uh, legal certificate. I'm from California and I'm a staff interpreter at the California court systems. I'm also the manager for all of the interpreting services that are provided for my county court system. A variety of different languages are used. Of course, my specialty area is ASL. But what I'd like to do today is share with you a little bit about what we're doing in California in terms of a pilot project that we have up and running where we've been using VRI. So let me tell you a little bit about the work that happens in the state of California in terms of the use of video remote interpreting, or VRI. I'm sure you probably already know what the acronym stands for. So I work in the courts as a court interpreter. And in the state of California, there is a committee that is formed as part of the administrative office of the courts, otherwise known as AOC. And within the AOC, there is an interpreter advisory group that's been established that incorporates a number of different interpreters who use different languages. Judges, attorneys as well are part of this particular committee. So four years ago, I joined the committee. And within that group, there are several different subgroups that are formed. One of those subgroups are the group that I'm a part of, and that's a subgroup that focuses on ASL, looking at deaf people in the court systems, interpreter usage, interpreter qualifications and certifications, and various other needs that are um, observed within interpreters in the court system. So the AOC has asked our group to come up with a set of guidelines Guidelines in terms of how VRI services can be used, when they might be used, if they can be used, and other like guidelines. So our group came together and after a lot of deliberation and brainstorming, we came up with a number of ideas that uh, we have come up with in terms of VRI usage in the court systems. Now let me clarify here, I am the only ASL interpreter as a part of this subgroup. There are a variety of other uh, language usage users who are involved, but let me tell you about the makeup of that committee. We have one judge who sits on the committee. We have the court CEO. There's also a Spanish interpreter and another interpreter who speaks Chinese, both Mandarin and Cantonese. So the person is certified in both of those languages. There's also an attorney, and we, by the way, is a public defender. And this is a public defender who's in a more senior position, uh, head of the department, in fact. And there's also an SME. A subject matter expert. So we call that person the SME. That happens to be a deaf person who is also a CDI. And then an AOC staff member who helps us as well. So that gives you a sense of the makeup of that committee. So the AOC has asked us to come up with or develop guidelines we worked on this project for about three years, and it was at about that time that the group decided that we couldn't move forward. And the reason is because we felt we really needed to test out some of these guidelines. I mean, they looked good on paper, but what would they look like in the real world? So we decided to hold up on what we were doing and go back to the AOC and ask them to help us set up a pilot project. So, in fact, that's what we've done. And we have this pilot project that is underway throughout the state of California. We have five different counties that are part of this pilot project. And we expect to pilot this for the next six months, and we are not quite complete with that six-month pilot process. We are still in process, but uh, the final report and review has yet to be compiled, so I did want to make sure you were aware of that. There are six different counties that are a part of this pilot project from all over the state of California, from the northern section, middle section, and southern section. Three counties are considered the feeder or rather provider counties. There are interpreters working in those counties who provide interpreting services to the other three counties. And those are the three counties where interpreting services are needed just because there are insufficient interpreters that are qualified in the local area. So for that reason, VRI seems to be a great way to provide services within the courtroom. And these uh, services are connected through internet connections to the interpreters who are working in those other three counties. 
the three feeder services are providing interpreting services to those three counties that are receiving it. So as I said, six counties total involved. The three counties that are the providing the interpreting services, two of those counties actually have the studios that have been built into the court bill rooms. So the interpreters report there to do their work. And of those two, in one of the counties, there's a staff ASL interpreter who works, and then the other county provides interpreting services on an as-needed contractual basis. The third county has actually tested out a home studio system, so we can uh, determine how what would be most effective. So you really can't see the difference between the studios that are happening within the courtroom and those that are in the home, but we're just seeing what would be most effective. You know, I've just realized that one of my slides is missing, so I apologize for that, but let me go ahead and just recap what was on that slide. I had two lists on that slide, one list that really talked about the appropriate uses of VRI, and the other was when VRI should not be used. And um, so if a court system in the county should need an interpreter, we show them the different instances where VRI would be most appropriately used, and then the other instances where VRI is not an option. So there are certain restrictions and limitations. So let me talk about when VRI can be used. First off, if the court proceeding is less than 30 minutes long, um, we don't want any long trials, anything that lasts all day being done through VRI, so things that are short in nature. And very often that's the case in court situations. I know that people at this conference may not all be in court interpreters, but I know for most people when you think about courtrooms, you think about what you see on television with the jury and the different attorneys deliberating. But really in real life, oftentimes these interactions are very short. The attorney comes into the courtroom, meets with their client briefly, maybe they're waiting for a report and as a result have to request a postponement. They make that request of the judge, maybe for a month's postponement, and then once the judge grants permission for that, it's all said and done. So really, basically, very short interactions. So that's one of the stipulations. It has to be under 30 minutes long. Another one of our guidelines, and this is what we've put in right now, is that there cannot be any testimony being given. And again, we know that testimony can be very complicated in nature, so uh, that's something that we are making sure it's not done through VRI. So no full trials can be accessed through VRI services. In fact, we call these two things events as opposed to trials. Events and proceedings are considerations for times when VRI might be used. Another instance is um, we want to make sure that the deaf person is actually present in the courtroom with their attorney, because very often people who can hear uh, get this notion that VRI is exactly like VTC, video teleconferencing. And so the notion is that you've got someone maybe, I don't know, in Washington, D.C., and another person in California and someone else in Phoenix, Arizona, and they're all remotely kind of linking in. But, of course, we know that's not what VRI is. We need to have the attorney and the client both present in the courtroom with the interpreter being the only person who's remotely brought into that setting. And also we thought it was very important that uh, the deaf person be a user of ASL, um, using ASL as it's used customarily in the community, that they're not language deficient in any way, that they're not getting kind of any issues with their language, because if so, we'd want a live in-person interpreter brought in. So that was another one of our stipulations. We also did note that sometimes as a result of the ADA, interpreters are brought in for individuals who are observing the courtroom proceeding. So there's no deaf defendant involved, there's no deaf party as a witness in the actual court proceedings, but maybe it's just parents, uh, deaf parents of an adult child, maybe in their 30 years old, 30 years old or older, and they want to just access what's happening with their uh, court proceedings of their child. So in that case, we could use uh, VRI for that. In California court systems, we also have these self-help rooms where attorneys are present to provide uh, free assistance for filling out divorce paperwork or for small claims paperwork. And in many of those self-help instances, we're also testing out the use of VRI as well. So these are the recommendations. And remember, I just want to mention again, we are not complete with this process. We're still in the testing phase. Instances where we felt VRI would not be effective, 
um, would be such that maybe there's an ASL interpreter locally who could be brought in, in person. Of course, an in-person interpreter is also always, always preferred over VRI. Another instance might be if this proceeding is going to last an extended period of time or for some reason is complicated in nature, then an in-person VRI interpreter is much better than VRI. Also, if there's any sworn testimony being given, uh, VRI is not the best service. And there are a couple of reasons for that. And I know other court systems may be doing something a bit different, but I know for us, we felt that it was very important that the attorney, and as you know, there's always an opposing attorney that will uh, question the witness after the uh, defendant's attorney has questioned them. During direct examination, it's important that the attorney have an opportunity to ask questions, and there's a lot of necessary visual communication that happens. When the opposing attorney begins questioning the witness, they may be more adversarial in nature, and again, visual information is critical to that process. So for that reason, we feel that an in-person interpreter is much better than a VRI. And as we mentioned, if the deaf person is not using customary ASL, if it's uh, maybe ASL that's of a different nature or not that ASL that's used by the community, then an interpreter and maybe even a CDI could be brought in person. One of the other things that we required is that every single party involved in the proceedings must have a say in this. You know, oftentimes in courtrooms you have court reporters, or nowadays it's just uh, courtroom proceedings are taped or for the record. So uh, we have to make sure that that individual is accepting of it, that the prosecutor, the DA defense attorney is also accepting a VRI, that the parties involved as well as the judge support the use of VRI. And if at any point in time during the proceedings an unexpected issue comes up or any concern is raised by any of the parties involved, including the interpreter, at that point in time everything can be brought to a halt and we will stop the provision of VRI services, and instead an in-person interpreter will be brought in. So any party involved in that uh, proceedings can stop it at any point in time. One other critical thing, um, it's very important that the defendant and their attorney have an opportunity to have private conversations. So um, that might mean that perhaps the VRI individual is access or individuals accessing the VRI through a remote monitor that is brought in on a cart, maybe to a different room so that conversation can happen between the attorney and their client. Or if it's in a very remote rural area and the courtroom is able to actually have the judge ask individuals to leave the courtroom, if there's not many of them there, then the attorney can have a private conversation with their client through the VRI service that way. But the key thing is to make sure that the conversation can be accessed privately, um, visually privately, and also auditorily so that no one else can access that information. I also mentioned uh, we have yet to complete all of the pilot process and pilot program. We are looking at different events. We've actually got 30 different events that we've been able to record. And uh, we have some recommendations that we are been able to uh, meet and through the recommendations provide VRI services. And if they didn't meet the VRI recommendations, we didn't provide the service. The feedback so far has indicated that everyone feels either it's effective or a neutral. Now we don't have all of the data collected because some people have forgotten to complete their forms, but everybody so far has said that it's been effective or they've reported neutral in terms of their response. There was one instance that didn't occur that way. Um, there was a room that was used outside of the courtroom and individuals were gathered around a table where a microphone was placed in the center and their voices was supposed to be picked up through the microphone, but they'd forgotten to turn the microphone on. So it was a relatively small room, and the interpreter was having a hard time hearing and needed more volume, and so that's a very easy fix. I mean, a simple phone call asking the microphone to be turned on would have remedied the situation immediately. So it seems like uh, very positive feedback thus far, but again, we are being very cautious. We do want to make sure that the limitations that we have put forth are abided by, and because of those limitations, I believe that's why we've seen such a great success. There is one other point I wanted to mention, and that's the importance of technology. You know, I'm not going to go into great detail about what kind of technology is most effective, but I do want to say it's important that you get very good quality equipment. VTC, the video teleconferencing equipment that I mentioned earlier, from my experience, really is not effective. It's insufficient for being able to transmit visual signals through ASL quickly enough. You need to have a system that supports visual communication 
uh, the other systems maybe have good audio transmission, but the video transmission is often grainy or it's um, impossible to read what you're seeing visually because of the blurriness that's occurring. So it's important to buy technologies that are HD. Um, we, we use HD, in fact, so that sign language is seen easily and then also that you have high-speed connections. Um, a number of interpreters have worked in VRS settings, and of course, deaf people have consumers of VRS services, and we all know that, um, well, interpreters at least know that sometimes it's very hard to understand callers that are coming in through the VRS service just because of the graininess or the um, just the signal not being as good of quality as it can be, and that can cause you know issues because of the degraded video uh, transmission. So we have been able to control the technologies on both ends. The interpreter's technology is controlled by us as well as the consumer's uh, technology. So we require that both ends have high-speed internet connection, both ends have HD and other equipment that is of high quality. Because if either one of the ends doesn't work, you know, it's going to cause issues. As we know through the VRS setting, a degraded video can cause a lot of issues. So we always try to do test runs to make sure that the equipment is up and running and very effective before we actually move to the live setting. So I just wanted to mention the most importance of, of having that uh, good technology. And because of the constraints that we've listed and the high technology, I think that's why we've seen such great success. So that's an update on what we're doing in California. Thank you very much.